Hello everybody, welcome to The Inclusion Coach. My name is Rebecca and I am your Inclusion Coach. Last time we talked about stereotypes, how stereotypes form the basis of some of the assumptions that we make about the people in the world around us. This time we're talking about how those stereotypes and assumptions can turn into microaggressions and I'll be giving you a foolproof way to challenge when you hear or see a microaggression. First of all, what is a microaggression? Well, it's often very subtle. It's something that somebody says or does that betrays a stereotypical assumption about the person they're talking to or talking about. So let me give you a few examples. First of all, the person who compliments a person of colour on their English being so good, when in fact English is their native language. Or it's asking the only woman in the room in a meeting to take the notes, or to pour the drinks, or to clear up the drinks afterwards, because she's the woman and that's her job, right? And there are some well-documented examples of black professors and speakers turning up to an event and being shown to the kitchens to put on their uniforms with the catering staff. The assumption being that they can't possibly be tonight's speaker. There's nothing micro about that microaggression. Now, as aspiring allies, when we see or hear a microaggression, we need to challenge it. If we don't challenge it, we're letting it pass and we are complicit. I know it can feel uncomfortable. I know it can feel daunting. And that's what stops us from doing it. And that's what stops change from happening. My foolproof method allows you to make that challenge without worrying about what comes next. So let me set the scene for you. Let's say you're going into the office kitchen to make yourself a hot drink. And there in the kitchen are two guys. There's a black guy called Roy and a white guy called Mel. And as you walk in, you can hear they're talking about running. And Mel says to Roy, oh, I wouldn't want to run you in a race, mate. You'd beat me hands down. And your ally radar goes off. Mel could be assuming that because Roy is black, he will run fast. Because the stereotype is that all black men are fast runners, right? The thing about microaggressions though is that they can be so subtle and so nuanced that you're not sure that you're hearing or seeing a microaggression. So here's what might be going through your head. Oh my God, I can't believe Mel just said that. Has Roy noticed or am I imagining it? Was it racist or am I reading too much into it? Will Roy think I'm being patronising if I say something? I'm not sure how to debate this anyway. I might make things worse. Nah, I'll leave it. If we let that comment go, we have shown that we are not prepared to be an active ally. And I often quote the words of Martin Luther King, who said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And this applies to any microaggression you witness. And you'll notice that I'm not making any assumptions about what Roy is thinking here. I do not have black lived experience. It would be really disrespectful for me to try and imagine how he's feeling and what he's thinking. So what do you do? What is this foolproof method of which I speak? It's simple. It's a short, mild question. All you do is say, what makes you say that? The word what rather than why makes it a curious question rather than a demanding one. And at this point, it is possible that Mel will say, well, not that it's any of your business, but Roy and I are in the same running club and he always runs faster than me. And if that's the case, fair enough, no microaggression. What's probably more likely is that Mel will look faintly surprised or irritated and say, what do you mean, what do I mean? I was just commenting that Roy's probably going to be a faster runner than me. And you can follow up with another what question. Well, what makes you think that? What we're trying to do is get to the stereotypical assumption because Roy is black, he will run faster than a white man. If Mel is a fellow aspiring ally, he may well say, 
Oh, how did that come across? Oh, oh gosh, no, I didn't mean... Oh, uh, I'm really sorry. My bad. I'm really sorry, Roy. I will do better. Once an aspiring ally realises how they've betrayed a microaggression, they learn from it, they make sure it doesn't happen again. They are grateful for being called out. If Mel is not a fellow aspiring ally, Mel may well get defensive and say, look, it was a compliment. This is none of your business. Why are you poking your nose in? I mean, it's a joke. It's just a bit of banter. What's wrong with you? One, it's only a joke if both people are laughing. Two, banter is often a smokescreen for people realising they've said the wrong thing, but feeling defensive about being called out about it. People often hide between intent and impact. They didn't intend any harm, so the person who feels harmed should forgive them, right? No, even if the intent was good, if the impact is harmful, an apology, learning and doing better are all necessary. So it could well be very uncomfortable in that kitchen right now, but that's good. Prioritising your own comfort and prioritising Mel's comfort is deprioritising Roy. You won't be surprised to hear that your challenge this week is to use that sentence. What makes you say that? In person, if you can, or you might think it when you're watching a news broadcast, when you're reading stuff on social media. Just challenge yourself and others. What makes you say that? Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.